With the NHL wrapping up their games in Stockholm, Sweden this weekend, what better time to dive into one of the game's hottest stars, Sweden's own William Nylander of the Toronto Maple Leafs. With Toronto being such a hockey hotbed and media crazed market, Nylander has long been a polarizing topic of discussion in the city, but one thing is for certain, your uncle, grandpa, neighbor, or angry local hockey fan at the bar was totally wrong about William Nylander. The narrative that followed him for the first several years of his career being soft, unengaged, lazy, and certainly selfish could not be further from the truth. With Willie Styles being on such a tear to start the year, I want to dive into his stats, his story, and most importantly, see what makes him a legit star in the NHL today. But first, hit that subscribe button. It's what William Nylander would want. To begin this story, let's go all the way back to when he was first drafted. William Nylander was guaranteed to be a first round pick heading into the 2014 NHL entry draft, but we didn't know where exactly he would fall. He was the second ranked European skater by the NHL Central Scouting, and it was clear that he had all the skill in the world. But in 2014, GMs were still very focused on size and strength over speed and skill, especially when it came to the draft. Not to mention, there were a lot of questions regarding his personality, mostly stemming from his father, Michael Nylander's reputation around the NHL. Michael was a fantastic player in his day, who tallied 679 points in 920 career NHL games, but had rubbed a lot of people around the game the wrong way. Scouts and executives referred to Michael as selfish, multiple former teammates called him one of the worst teammates they'd ever seen. Michael played for seven different NHL teams, including two stops in Washington, which certainly played into this narrative about his locker room issues, we'll say. Anyways, we get to the 2014 NHL draft, and the big bodies are taken early. Aaron Ekblad, Sam Reinhart, Leon Dreisaitl, and Sam Bennett get taken in that order, and rightfully so at the time. Then, Michael Dal Cole and Jake Vertanen go 5th and 6th, fitting that big-bodied Canadians narrative. And then, the Toronto Maple Leafs, who had recently fired truculent general manager Brian Burke, were on the clock with the 8th pick. GM Dave Nonis drafts William Nylander 8th overall at 5 foot 11, 169 pounds, out of Moto in the Swedish Hockey League, where he had just played on a line with his father, Michael. After the pick, Nonis doubled down on his selection, saying, Nylander might be the most skilled player in the draft. The old school hockey crowd, led by Don Cherry at the time, were absolutely outraged at this pick. I'm going to insert this clip here because it cracks me up every time. So what do we say? Who did they pick? They picked the little guy. We won't say who it is. They sent him back to Sweden to save his life. They pass on a guy, Nick Ritchie, who is six foot three, 230 pounds, 100 minutes of penalties. Oh, you're going to say he's a dummy, eh? He, only three guys in the whole draft scored more goals than this guy. And guess who picked them up right after that? Anaheim and Bob Murray, who was executive of the year. They couldn't believe that you'd pass on a guy six foot three. Now, this is even funny. You're looking at it from 2023 here, knowing that the Maple Leafs ultimately signed Nick Ritchie as a free agent for the 21-22 season and put him on waivers after just 33 games with the team. But the point of this video isn't to bash Ritchie or Cherry. It's to build the story of Willie Stiles and share the narrative that was created around him. Willie signed his entry-level deal after being drafted and was sent to Moto in Sweden, as Cherry so elegantly said, and improved his stats from seven Seven points in 22 games the year prior to 20 points in 21 games this time around. He left Moto halfway through the season to play in the World Juniors and then report to the Toronto Marlies in the AHL. He finished fifth in the 2015 World Junior Championships in points with 10 in seven games behind only Canadians Sam Reinhart, Nick Patan, Connor McDavid, and Max Domi. Willie immediately found his stride in North America with the Marlies, recording 32 points in 37 games with the AHL club, helping propel them to the playoffs despite being near the bottom of the standings when he joined them in early January. Nylander began the 2015-2016 season again with the Toronto Marlies, and after putting up an impressive 45 points in 38 games, the Leafs called him up to make his NHL debut on February 29, 2016. Now it's important to remember that that Leafs team stunk and ultimately won the draft lottery, but he managed to score his first career goal a week after being called up. 
Funny enough, it was assisted by Brooks Leach, who also assisted on his father, Michael's, last NHL goal. Nylander was up for a few weeks, but was ultimately sent back to the Marlies for their playoff run, as they had a super deep AHL team. Willie recorded a stellar 11 points in 14 playoff games with the Marlies, but they fell just short in the playoffs. The next season, 2016-2017, Willie made his full-time presence felt in the NHL, playing on a line with recent first overall pick Austin Matthews and fellow Marley Zach Hyman, They were Toronto's young, promising line. Of course, we all remember Matthews' four-goal NHL debut, but it was actually William Nylander who won Rookie of the Month that month for October with 11 points in his first nine games that season. When all was said and done, Nylander wrapped up his first full NHL season with 22 goals, 39 assists for 61 points in 81 games, and was a big reason that the Leafs surprised everybody and made the playoffs. He recorded four points in six playoff games before ultimately losing to the powerhouse Washington Capitals. He finished sixth in the Rookie of the Year voting, which his linemate Austin Matthews took home for his trophy case. Willie then reported to Team Sweden for the World Championships, where he led the team in points with 14 in 10 games, while Sweden captured the gold medal. Nylander looked pretty good the following year, but not great. He wrapped up with an identical total of 61 points in 82 games this time, including an 11-game scoring drought which obviously brought out all the haters in Toronto. The Leafs got Boston in the first round and lost as we know, but Willie had a nice showing with 4 points in the 7-game playoff series. Now this is where things really start to pick up in the old man yelling at clouds department as Nylander became a restricted free agent in the summer. He wanted a long-term deal in Toronto, not a bridge deal which was becoming increasingly popular around the league, and ultimately missed training camp due to not reaching an agreement with the team. So now, the small, soft Swede wants more money than he's worth. At least that's what the talk track was in Toronto at the time. General manager Kyle Dubas eventually signed William Nylander to a six-year, $45 million contract, averaging a $6.9 million cap hit per season, mere minutes before the December 1st deadline, which would have forced him to sit out the entirety of the season. Nylander ramped back up into game shape, sitting out a few of the first games into December and ultimately he ended up having a bad season. He recorded a measly 7 goals and 20 assists for 27 points in 54 games, added 3 points in 7 playoff games against the Bruins, but now the Boo Birds were really out for the air quotes overpaid William Nylander. He again reported to Team Sweden at the World Championships and he got some of that confidence back. He was dominant. He led the entire tournament with 18 points in just 8 games, although Sweden unfortunately lost in the quarterfinals despite winning gold at the prior two tournaments. The following season, Season, Willie found a new gear in his game. He came into the season motivated and ready, ready to prove the haters wrong from the year prior, and was much closer to the six foot, 205 pound player that we see today. Mike Babcock was relieved of his head coach duties early in the 2019 2020 campaign, and William Nylander really began to flourish under new head coach Sheldon Keefe. His ice time went up from 1531 per game the year prior to 1813 a night now. His shot totals went way up, he tripled last year's abysmal five. 5.4 shooting percentage. Willie smashed his career high in goals with 31, added 28 assists for 59 points in 68 games before the world came to a halt due to COVID. When we returned to some normalcy, Willie totaled four points in their five game qualifying round loss to the Columbus Blue Jackets. But this, this was the William Nylander that we were waiting for. The 2020-2021 season was shortened again due to COVID restrictions, but Nylander didn't slow down his pace from the year prior. He took a few less shots and ended up with just 17 goals in the 51 games, but added 25 assists for a total of 42 points. Come playoff time, the Leafs choked against the Montreal Canadiens, as they do, but to no fault of William. He was the Leafs' best player in the series, racking up 5 goals and 8 total points in the 7-game series. Another disaster ending for the Leafs, but yet another step forward for Willie. In 2021-2022, Nylander really took off. For the second year in a row, he spent majority of his time with John Tavares as opposed to Austin Matthews, a change that was made under head coach Sheldon Keefe. His power play numbers went up, his shot volume went up, and he was driving the net with much more purpose. He finished one point shy of a point per game with 80 points in 81 games, including a new career high of 34 goals. He looked good again in the playoffs, adding 7 points in 7 games, but the Leafs were bound.
trounced yet again, this time by Tampa Bay. He switched to a Sherwood stick early in the year and has never looked back. His first 40-goal season, adding 47 assists for 87 total points in an 82-game season. His time on ice was up, his shot attempts were way up, and he finished over a point per game for the first time in his career, despite scoring less power play goals than the year prior. In the playoffs, Willie solidified himself as a force, tallying 10 points in the Leafs' 11 games as they finally won a playoff round. Now that brings us to this season, where Willie has been absolutely lighting the world on fire. At the time of recording this, the Leafs have played 16 games and he has a point in every single one of them. That's right, a 16 game point streak to start the season. And it's not just one point per game, he currently sits at 25, 11 goals and 14 assists in those 16 games. Not only does he sit second in the league in points behind the three tied Canucks, but he's doing it, air quotes, the right way. He's winning puck battles low in the offensive zone to lead to scoring chances for his team, and according to NHL Edge, he's in the 92nd percentile of shots on goal from right in front of the crease, aka the high danger area. From NHL Edge, he is also 99th percentile in shots on goal and 99th percentile in goals, which makes sense of course. They also show Willie is 94th percentile in top shot speed, with his hardest shot so far hitting 96.5 miles per hour. Not a bad rip for the soft undersized Swede. One of my favorite parts of Nylander's game from afar are his zone entries. He's got great edges and great hands and knows how to protect the puck really well. He attacks the middle of the ice and has both the speed to drive the net and the skill to curl back and control the puck till teammates arrive to help him if needed. NHL Edge shows that he is in the 93rd percentile of O-zone time and the 94th percentile of D-zone time, which for sure is because of his power play time and his O-zone draw starts, but I think his ability to drive zone entries himself and control the puck defensively is definitely reflected in this stat as well. His ice time is also up a full minute from last year, averaging over 19 and a half per game right now, and he's getting a little bit of penalty to kill time here and there. He currently sits 20th in the league in expected goals per money puck, and the Leafs have an insane 63% Corsi while William Nylander is on the ice. He has officially solidified himself as a legit star in this league. Now that we've gone through his career to date, let's talk about why your uncle was wrong. Since Mitch Marner, Austin Matthews, and John Tavares cashed their big tickets in Toronto, William Nylander has always been the guy that people look to blame. The other three make four plus million dollars more than Willie, so for years he has been the one put in trade rumors and the one that everybody wants to see shipped out of town. If you scroll Twitter or even Google for that matter, you will see thousands upon thousands of trade Nylander articles, tweets, and cries from the last five plus years. Despite all this, Nylander is making everybody eat their words. No longer is he tagged with the lazy, soft, and slow complaints, and frankly, he's been the Leafs' most consistent player this season. Austin Matthews scores the goals and will always be the top dog in Toronto, but I have no issue saying that William Nylander has been their second best player for at least the last 12 months. He's right with Matthews and Marner in career playoff points and always seems to show up when they need him the most. While we're on the topic, I really never understood why he got painted with the soft European narrative. He was quite literally born in Calgary. Due to his dad playing in the NHL, he lived in North America and played all his minor hockey here until his dad returned to Europe to play play in 2011, meaning when Willie was 14. He played youth hockey in Washington, Chicago, Maryland, New York, etc. And he played the world famous Quebec Pee Wee tournament as a member of the youth New York Rangers. It just never made sense to me. As for the personality issues that hockey people were concerned about ahead of his draft, they're nowhere to be seen. Sure, he has a nonchalant and carefree attitude off the ice, but honestly, that might be what makes him able to withstand the constant criticism in Toronto. Captain John Tavares said this year, Willie's designed to play in Toronto. He can take the criticism, it doesn't bother him, but that carefree attitude is off ice only. On the ice, he's engaged as ever. He is one of the most beloved teammates, not only in Toronto, but around the league too. Anybody he's ever played with, whether it was youth hockey in North America or back home in Europe, has great things to say about him. Much like former Leaf captain and fellow Swede Matt Sundin, Willie's just a very chill guy who keeps to himself and doesn't let the commotion bother him. And I know you want me to talk about his penning free agency, but honestly, I don't have a clue what's going to happen. Toronto will and should do everything in their power to sign him. They have to. 
but he's going to command over $10 million per season, especially if he gets to test the open market. If you're, say, Chicago or Anaheim, somebody wanting to come up with lots of money, maybe even Seattle or Arizona, why wouldn't you throw a bag at this guy? He's one of the best players on the planet right now. Hindsight's always 2020, but it's very funny that for a few years, some people in Toronto were so convinced that he was overpaid at $6.9 million only for that to end up being one of the best value deals in the league and him set to command a huge raise. Nylander's line mate, Captain John Tavares, recently said, I think it's pretty evident what he's done over the last 15 or 16 months here. He's put himself in the conversation with the best players in the game. You'd be very hard pressed to find somebody who disagrees with that statement from Tavares. William Nylander is a legit star in the NHL and soon he'll be paid like one.